In the same way that the Vincast scours Australia for the most interesting guests to have on the podcast to talk about wine with myself, the intrepid wino, Different Drop, the Vincast supporter, is scouring Australia for the most interesting and innovative wines. Often you won't find the kind of wines that they sell at differentdrop.com in the big chain liquor stores because they are small batch, very innovative produced wines and uh, often working with um, some really young and up and coming, very exciting winemakers. So um, in the same way that I get excited talking to um, producers that uh, some people might not have heard of, these guys love introducing the wines themselves to their consumers. And in a way of support for the podcast, uh, you can support the way they do. Go to differentdrop.com and for your first order over $100, you will actually get $25 off if you put in the special code VINCASTVINO at purchase. Uh, Many of the former guests of the podcast have their wines available on differentdrop.com and so why why not throw a bit of support their way as well and buy some of the wines that you can enjoy in home as you listen to the VINCAST. Thank you very much, Different Drop, for your support of the podcast. On episode 58 of the Vincast, I talk with wine by Brad himself, Brad Weir, the original surfing winemaker based in the Margaret River, behind such brands as Mantra and Amato Vino. I've got a question for you at the end of the episode, so make sure to stay tuned. Hello there, Vincasters, and welcome to another episode of the Vincast. My name is James Scarsbrook, otherwise known as the Intrepid Wino, and it is great to have you on for another episode. Uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you uh, for people who got in touch in the last week or so. Um, last Sunday, of course, at the uh, Soul for Wine event, where, uh, as I mentioned, Campbell Burton and uh, Morgan McClone were involved, uh, as well as a few other previous guests of the podcast. And um, it was great to have people come up and not only wish me a happy birthday, thank you to everyone who did that, but also I had several people say that they were listening to the podcast. So, of course, it's great to hear from people. They're enjoying uh, the wine chat. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully some of the people I saw on Sunday will be on the podcast very soon. I'm going to keep chasing them. And um, if you have some suggestions for guests you'd like to hear on the podcast, of course, I would love to hear from you. Uh, and you can do that on the social media or via email uh, or through the website. Now, um, I mentioned a I think a couple of times maybe that um, I'm planning to start doing live streaming wine tastings. I thought um, it'd be something different to do because, um, you know, I love watching videos about wine and wine tastings, that kind of thing. But um, there's not a lot of interactivity built into that. But um, if you do it live, that way people can actually taste at home with you and they can uh, ask questions or they can make comments. And so I'm going to, in the future, have some different winemakers, some Australian winemakers on the podcast, and you'll be able to buy some of their wines that will actually taste and you can ask them questions uh, as we taste through but uh, on the 27th of July I'm going to have a former guest of the podcast James Dawson who is a sommelier and friend of mine uh, and we're going we've we've selected six Grenache wines from uh, some really exciting producers here in Australia and uh, you can go to differentdrop.com and you can buy the kit it's actually called the Let's Taste Grenache pack um, and you can uh, buy those wines uh, as long as you get them before the 27th so my my suggestion is to buy them in the next couple of weeks uh, and uh, if you put in the code it's a special code uh, intrepid grenache uh, you'll actually get a 10% discount on that pack. Now, before I start this week's episode, uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Mountain Stirrer, uh, supporter of the podcast, for uh, very kindly going to the iTunes uh, page for the podcast and giving me a five-star rating and uh, a review. If you love wine, you'll enjoy this. Um, and so uh, I really wanted to thank him for his very kind words. And, of course, I would love to have more of you um, going on to the iTunes podcast page, giving me a five-star rating and, uh, and writing something nice. Uh, if you uh, liked a particular episode, a particular guest, 
um, you know, more than happy for you to, um, to, to, to tell me what you do like or what you uh, think I could do to improve the podcast. Um, so for this week's episode, I actually recorded uh, a little while ago via Skype with Brad Weir. Um, if you don't know who he is, he's probably most famously known by, as one by Brad with his amazing pop art inspired labels. Um, and more recently uh, has created Ma- um, Amato Vino, uh, making some beautiful alternative variety wines. And, uh, and so we chatted about his background and, uh, and some of the exciting things that he's doing to introduce uh, some different wines to the consumers of Australia. Um, stay tuned. I've got a question for you at the end of the episode. I hope you enjoy it. I'll see you on the other side. Brad, thank you very much for uh, joining me on the Vincast today. Uh, in, uh, I believe you're in Margaret River. Not so sunny, Margaret River. <laughs> no, uh, it's, uh, the sun's gone down here, so it's definitely not sunny here in Melbourne. But uh, thank you for making some time. Uh, and obviously, um, we finally met for the first time only recently when I was over in Margaret River and, uh, and I got the opportunity to be introduced to some of the wines and obviously to you more importantly. We had leftovers for dinner. We did. That was wonderful because uh, I think you'd actually, ironically, had just come back from Melbourne uh, for the uh, the big uh, 21st century vino event here in Melbourne, um, which was obviously championing alternative varieties in Australia. Very exciting stuff. So tell me, Brad, um, I always ask my, uh, my guest at the start of the episode, what was the first interaction with wine that you had that sort of set you on the path of, uh, of passion and, and career in wine? Ooh, long time ago. Actually, I, I don't come from Margaret River. I come from Albany down on the south coast of Western Australia and I moved to Margaret River following work and other things when I was a young bloke. And I remember driving to town um, from the south of town and driving past these vineyards and thinking, what the hell is that all about? Because the earliest introduction I probably had before that would have been drinking via seat at the drive-in or something like that. So um, I ended up meeting a, a girl who worked at one of the wineries and she said, we've got a, a job going in cellar door. And I said, put me down. So on the weekends, I went out to Lewin Estate and did cellar door. What was it that was, actually uh, brought you to the Margaret River? Um, following work, I used to work in, um, in a bank, would you believe, me with my Long haired hippie. No, sort of yeah, Mr. Mr. Groovy of Mark River. <laughs> I cannot imagine that. Well, I think that's probably why I left the bank. They wouldn't. They wouldn't let me have long hair. But um, <laughs> that was. Yeah, were I still were you much in of a bank surfer for a couple of years while I did weekend work at Lewin Estate and Xanadu Wines or Chateau Xanadu at the time, um, and learnt uh, staff a bit of everything really enough to be dangerous in all respects. So was it a, a gradual sort of, of osmosis um, based on your environment that kind of got you more and more interested in wine or was there a particular in, in, instance or a, a wine that kind of got you? I reckon, really, uh, well, there was a wine for sure. I, I remember probably the first day of working Salvador at Lewin Estate and just following someone else around learning stuff uh, and it, in the evening staff sat down and had a glass of wine left over from the cellar door and somebody poured me a glass of art series chardonnay i think it was like 83 or something um and i had a a look a sniff and a taste and i went shit this is that's pretty amazing this was a guy drank beer and and and, um stone's ginger ale probably at that time um so yeah that was the 83 luna state art Art series chardonnay which really uh yeah caught Got the bug caught from there, and uh, uh, from then on, I just thought, yeah, this is what I want to do. So my banking career wasn't destined for too much longer. And what what was the, the sort of the market for tourism for wine, particularly in the Margaret River back then? There, uh, there still probably weren't that many wineries, I wouldn't think. Um, were, were people coming down from Perth that much? Uh, Margaret River has long been a destination for tourists, but yeah, with wineries, there's probably only about 10 or 12 then, maybe a few more, but, um, but you know, the Lewins and the Vast Felixes, the Cullens and Mossbridge and so forth. So wine tourism, as we know it today, probably wasn't there, but there was definitely plenty of people, um, you know, coming down, visiting wineries. The Lewin Estate had a pretty impressive cellar door at the time. Um, so it, 
yeah, it's nothing like today, wine, the wine tourism or the wine and food tourism of today, but definitely Margaret River had its appeal and not just wine. There was the, the, obviously the coast, the environment, the surfing, the forests and the caves. So it definitely was a tourist destination even before wine. Mm. And what was it like working in a, in a cellar door uh, back in those days? That was cool. Got to drink a lot of shit hot wine and hang out, do wine tours, show people around. Um, yeah, it was good. It's probably, I mean, it was learning the ropes, really. I mean, you get to walk through the cellar every day doing doing tours and chatting with the winemakers. So, um, yeah, it was just a bit of a, a learning curve, but just really enjoyed it. So I didn't mind working five days a week in a bank and two days a week on the weekend. So I was working <laughs> seven, seven days a week for a while, but I just loved it. That's didn't feel like a job. It felt like fun. Well, that's the, that's the big difference, I think, for a lot of people who work in the wine industry. You, you sort of you almost pinch yourself because you can't believe you actually are living from working with a product and working with people who are you know so passionate. It's, it's just so much fun. Yeah, well, the fun makes up for the meager living. <laughs> yeah, it is a sacrifice, I think. <laughs> Um, and, and, and I, I mean, I had a similar kind of experience, you know, when I started, my sort of real start was in, in Silador in Domain Chandon in the Yarra Valley. You know, ah. it's, it's not, not too far from Melbourne. So it was a, a slightly easier commute than it would be from Perth to uh, Mark River, of course. Yeah, for sure. Um, but one of the things that I loved about it, and I'm not sure if, you know, if it was the same for you, but when you're talking with consumers, they're all kind of out for a, a lovely day, a good time. They want to learn a little bit. They want to taste some nice wines they're just sort of very open they're open-minded i really enjoyed that experience exactly. and then connecting with them with, <clears throat> with a, a wine or with the winemaker or you know or saying oh you know go to this place for dinner or go down the road to this winery they're, they're lovely down there as well yeah i think for the most part in australia cellar doors then maybe even now we're misunderstood or the cellar door people or the owners misunderstood what it was all about i mean it's Really, sales of wine is not too hard in cellar doors. People are on holidays, they're having a good time, they're there for a reason. Um, they'd like to buy a bottle of wine as long as everything fits, but you just got to let them have their have their way. Ask them how their holiday's going, what have they been up to, what, what have they seen, and, and get them to talk about themselves. They can rant on for five or ten minutes. You hardly have to mention wine at all, and in, in the end, if they've had a good experience, they'll walk out the door with a, a few bottles or maybe a case. It's pretty easy, really. So, so essentially, you were kind of hooked, um, you know, right from the get go working at Lou. And um, how long did you end up working there? And and were you just working in Celador for the time being, or did you kind yeah. of start to branch out and do some other stuff as well? I was interested in the other stuff, but Celador was where it was at mainly. But um, probably about eighteen months, two years there, and I was doing work at Chateau Zanadu as well, which was at the time the antithesis of Lewin in a way because it was a bunch of young crew. Uh, we were like 24, 25 years old. The winemaker was, the, the general manager was. Um, you know, we didn't play classical music in the cellar doors like they used to. We played Tom Waits or David Bowie or Miles Davis or something. Um, so it was definitely a destination for tourists to come and see uh, a bunch of long-haired hippies running a winery and, and um, making a good fist of it. So, uh, yeah, so after Lewin, it was Shadow Xanadu. Um, I did some work. Okay, Hay Shed Hill, back under the old owners. I just moved around a bit and mostly sales and admin kind of stuff and marketing until I got, you know, was able to, to wander into the sellers a few times. Well, at Xanadu, we did a bit of, you know, seller work and bottling work and stuff. So, um, I mean, the passion was always there to do winemaking at some point. It just took a long time to, to realise itself. Well, certainly for me, one of the things that I liked about working in, in Cellador, but, you know, certainly in marketing was that you're actually uh, touching um, every single element of the business and the industry, you know, you, you, you're actually yeah. c communicating with winemakers, with viticulturists, with, you know, production operations, you're talking with finance, you're talking with the sales force. And then, you know, in a lot of cases, you're talking with consumers and, you know, to a certain extent, media as well. Um, yeah. you know, that, in that way, you kind of learn about every element of, of the business and, and, you yeah, there's of... not too many industries that you don't have that uh, where, where you have that experience of working from maybe even planting the grapes in the first place and, and tending the vineyard and then picking, making wine, watching it grow, you know, watching it evolve and, and then actually handing it over to a customer at the end of the day and get some dollars back for it. There's not many industries where you can do that sort of stuff. Plus you actually get to talk to the end consumer and sort of find out what they're interested in and, and maybe try and work out why they like one wine yeah. more than another one. Yeah. 
So where did the, the sort of the, the next next phase of Margaret River start for you? Um, I phases, God. I just kept ploughing away to different wineries, working in vineyards sometimes. Uh, well, a lot of the times actually. Yeah, unless someone th- throws a bit of money at you and says, "There you go, go and set up a winery," you, you don't have much opportunity to do it for your own, for, you, for yourself. Mm. So it took took me quite a few years to start up my own business, and that was about twelve or thirteen years ago. Um, and even then, I didn't have a winery, you know, way back in the start. But, um, but yeah, organically, it takes a while to get to that point. Um, so I'd like to say there was a strategy, but there wasn't a strategy. It was just like living life. Enjoying Margaret River, enjoying a bit of travelling, uh, enjoying drinking lots of interesting wines uh, from Margaret River and outside of Margaret River, uh, and then eventually branching off and doing my own thing. And that's what everybody wants to do at the end of the day: is do their own thing. Did you get much opportunity to travel outside of Margaret River to other wine regions in Australia or overseas? Yeah, I did. I worked for a company that, that consulted. Um, worked, worked for two years for a company that consulted across New Zealand, South Africa, Australia, and so I got to see heaps of different regions from the big commercial ones, the big commercial wineries um, to the tiny little places. And, um, yeah, that was a bit of an eye-opening experience as well. And through that through that experience, I learned a lot uh, whilst not being hands-on at any of those wineries so much. It was just looking and learning and just picking stuff up. So that was probably, um, I guess, if you want to talk phases, that was a, a good phase, a good learning phase that sort of set me up for what I'm doing now. Mm. So what were the what were the, the kind of as far as the different countries? What were the kind of the big things you noticed about how they were different? Um, the Kiwis weren't too different to Australia. This is before the big Sav Blanc boom, um, but certainly the cooler climate stuff. The, the um, Pinots uh, from New Zealand were exceptional, and I hadn't had that ex- much exposure in Australia to the Pinot, um, so I was really interested. In WA. It. <laughs> WA, Margaret River, not much in the way of Pinot, but no great southern in WA's. Knocking out some really good pinots, but the Kiwis were, were doing it well, and, and Chardonnay, and of course Sav Blanc. South Africa were kind of going through that um, their own um, rejuvenation. The older winemakers who taught themselves or whatever, or learnt off the Europeans, um, were handing over to younger guys. There was heaps of Australians actually and Kiwis going to New- South Africa during that time uh, in the mid to late nineties, uh, so called teaching them how to make. You know, how to make wine and grow grapes properly. Um, that might sound a bit rough to South Africans listening, but um, that's kind of how it felt at the time. They were they were seeking. They'd come out of you know being shut down by the world for a number of years, and they were opening up and, and wanting to learn what had happened in you know in the meantime, pretty much. And the changes in wine making and vineyard management. Um, they were looking to suck it up and learn, and now they're doing some really good shit over there in South Africa. Yeah, I've heard. You know, obviously, Ed, there is actually some wine imported into Australia. There, there's this a similar kind of revolution going on. Well, like in a way that there's a revolution going on with Australian wine and Australian, young Australian winemakers. They're going through a, you know, a slightly groovier, breaking the rules kind of thing, skin contact and sustainability yeah. and stuff like that as well. Yeah, heaps of little guys, and even Stardy's one of those guys. They're making some really good wine, really interesting wines, and that's what it, it's all about now. Is um, and I think for Margaret River. Uh, yeah, that's what they have to realise a little bit too is that uh, unless you've got this massive market for Sam Sav, Chardonnay and Cabernet, which a lot of them do, they've been around a long time, but they've got that market, uh, you need to do something a little bit different uh, here and there as well. But if you're starting out now from Margaret River, I mean, I don't know why you would start out with Sam Sav, Chardonnay and Cab because everybody's you know pretty much got one um, and I think things come in cycles. I mean, it's probably Margaret River's going through a cycle now where people have where it had been overexposed for a few years but the sort of stuff that I'm doing or a few of us are doing at the moment um, is it's to be different but it's also fun and also following the passion so you're not just doing it for the market. Um, all those things add up and if the market likes it, that's great too. Um, but, yeah, we've watched Sim Sav sales decline over a number of years uh, due to the Sav Blanc invasion and um, you know, perhaps consumer tastes are changing a little bit or they're being directed by the supermarkets to change their tastes. Um, but I guess my view is that, yeah, I I'll, I'll definitely love Sim Sav and those, those blends. I love Chardonnay and Cabernet, so I'm still going to make them and, and make them well and, and um, get out there and get behind them. Um, but I'm also playing around on the fringes with 
unique varieties or um, yeah, rarer varieties, I suppose, uh, and interesting winemaking methods and just really exploring that side of it, um, you know, after, after starting the business with not much money in my pocket um, whilst it, it's, it's been successful, not, you know, I haven't got a large amount of money in my pocket, but now I'm free to, to play a little bit now. So mm. uh, all those years of seeing people do interesting things, it's time to start doing it. So what was it in terms of when you started getting an idea and, and actually doing it as far as your own business, what kind of prompted you? Was it um, you kind of seeing opportunities that were being unmet? Was it um, yeah. you wanting Pretty to do much. something different and hoping the customers were going to come along or was it a uh, let's just try something? Pretty much let's just try something and it was probably um, a bit of a um, – a side project, I suppose, when I started the Wine by Brad label. The, the main, obviously, the main thing about that was the packaging. Um, you know, a lot of people hadn't seen that sort of stuff before. Again, it's only 12 or 13 years ago, but there just weren't funny, irreverent, quirky, fun, funky labels around. Well, not many, anyway, not from Australia. So to do that and then to go into, a, you know, retailers and try and sell it. And the, the wine in the bottle was the important thing. It had to be good because you had to back up this crazy label. Um, so where, where there might have been knockbacks on a crazy label, you had, you had to have decent wine and you had to win a few shows and um, so people would trust that there was, um, you know, good booze in the bottle. So, For those listeners who um, possibly haven't seen uh, these so-called crazy labels, tell me, um, can you describe it and can you tell me how you kind of, Came upon the 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 visual identity of the wine. Uh, yeah, well, to see it, you can go to amadovino.com.au. But <laughs> it started, it started as um, yeah, as a fun sitting around the fire one night with a few glasses of wine, a couple of mates, and talking about wine labels and why they're all so boring, um, and throwing a few ideas around. Um, and I don't remember exactly what was said because it was late in the evening, probably. But um, we. You know, a few of us talked about a label with your name on it. So um, although, you know, what eventually became this Wine by Brad label, um, there's a character, there's a couple of characters on the label. One is Brad and one is Becky and the Brad is not really me. He doesn't look like me but he's the kind of, what is he? He's the epitome of the, the wine lover, wine maker kind of dude and, and his lovely wife Becky. But uh, it's based on... Roy Lichtenstein retro pop art from the 60s, um, which became, but it's perpetually popular. You still see it in advertising today, the, the, you know, the, oh, Brad, I've left the baby on the bus kind of thing. Mm. So we, I thought, yeah, why not um, put a retro pop art comic strip uh, on the label? And uh, people thought that was a good, well, some people thought that was a good idea. Other people thought it was pretty stupid. But uh, in the end, I played around with a few designs uh, with a friend who was a graphic uh, sorry, an illustrator, uh, came up with some concepts, um, showed a few people who said, yeah, go on, go for it. And um, then we did. So um, ended up putting out about 250 cases each of Sem Sav and Cad Merlo. And again, the wine, yeah, you know, it's good wine. Well, it's not, wasn't special, but it wasn't, wasn't dross. As far as the wine, like what, what, what was going in? Like where were you getting the fruit from and, were you, were you, was it being made for you, or what yeah, was the it was idea being made for that? me? Yeah, it was being made for me. But um, uh, the first Sam Sav came off a of mate's vineyard, who I have still bought Sam and Sav off him in the years, um, you know, later subsequent years. And uh, in fact, last year I did too, bought some Sam off him, um, off his vineyard. So that's that's where that one started. And the Cab Merlot came, you know, pretty much from a, a winery who was looking to offload a bit. So. Um, those early stages definitely they were, they were stuff that I'd bought from mates or um, picked up a little, you know, a couple of barrels or something that someone didn't want and put it all together. Um, and that was, uh, yeah, that was 12 or 13 years ago now. But I think we, now we buy all fruit, make wine. So I've been doing that for a few years now. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, yeah, and, again, and it all, was, and it was wine by Brad. This was the. Yeah, wine by Brad. That's right. Yeah. So again, the, the Brad, I mean, I, that's my name, but. Um, and I love those sort of retro pop art cut the comics, but the, pretty much I kept my distance. You know, you know, me personally kept my distance from the from the label. It was more like the guy on the label was the was the leader of the pack. He's he's the man to talk to. So <laughs> I, I kind of kept a low profile. Um, but yeah, just just going around to retailers and restaurants and and um, feeling the the love or the hate for it was pretty interesting. But I knew that anyway. I knew that was going to happen. I knew people would 
would polarise people. Um, so if yeah, if you haven't heard it out there in, in podcast land, if you haven't heard of it, go and look at it up on our website and you'll see what I mean. But again, today it looks like, oh, yeah, it's another quirky label. It's still, I think it's still pretty clever. I quite like the idea still. Um, I'm, I'm not sick of it. But uh, the, That's the important yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. If you're uh, going to be looking at it more than anyone else. <laughs> that's right. No, I love it. I think it's great. Um, but the, the quirky label thing is, is quite common now, so people aren't, quite you know they're not thrown by it anymore they're not frightened of it anymore mm. and they understand that you can have a fun irreverent pack and still have good wine in the bottle that you'll come you know come back for that was the main thing as long as people um they could buy a bottle off the first time around on the label but they'll come back the second time around for the wine you know so how were you when you were kind of in the, those earlier days? <clears throat> how were you taking that to market? Were you sort of trying to do obviously the the visual language of the the label itself was one thing, but you know you still need to get in front of people. How were you kind of trying to get it in front of people, as it were? Yeah, good old shoe leather, as you know so well. Um, yeah, just getting out there locally first and then in Perth. Um, but I was quite you know quite surprised sort of that it it went so well. Um, because it was just a, a bit of an experiment at the time. I thought, well, if this, if this falls flat on, fa- on its face, then um, I'll, I'll just, you know, do something else, work for something else. But it kind of went really well, so I kept doing – I did another year and then another year. And here I am still doing it. But, yeah, you're basically just getting out there and showing people. So there are a lot of people who, you know, would march you straight out the door again you know, once they've seen it, but there were plenty of others who, um, who said, yeah, oh, that's really cool. And and funnily enough, well, not not that funny now, but people, the trade in those days were pretty conservative, particularly in Perth. Um, but those who took a gamble on it and put it in the store, once people started buying it, they realised, well, that's what my and perhaps you know, I say to women because women were always in the background with wine, um, and to have something irreverent, a funny label that wasn't. It wasn't targeted for women. It was anyone who wanted to buy it, really. But I found that women in general uh, really loved it. Wasn't and targeted, it, but they just responded to it. Yeah, they responded to it. Yeah, and I think um, again, I'm no pioneer in all this, but the the trade sort of picked up on that and thought, oh, actually, there's a market out there who, who will buy that stuff. So they started to be more. They started to explore more themselves. Um, and of course, you know, now with all the quirky labels, all the imports coming into the country, there's so many labels out there. People aren't that frightened anymore, and new varieties and things. So, um, I found that when I went back into wine retail, well, it was an independent wine retail uh, that was back in 2010. They seem to be sort of uh, more on offer as far as those kind of eye-catching labels that. May or may not, you know, there were some good wines, but there were some that were just sort of, oh, this is just, you you, bought, you basically bought some bulk crap and you're putting it into some, and you're giving it some, like, I, I remember this one that was called Bitch, and yeah. I was like, really? You know? Yeah. Uh, and I, I just, I, I did start to get a little bit cynical, but I remember seeing um, some of the stuff made by the guys, uh, some young punks, Yeah. you know, and they were appropriating some really groovy kind of, like, Pulp fictiony kind of seventies yeah, exactly, yeah. B movie sort of looking labels that were really yeah, they beat and, me to it, <laughs> but they were but but they were good wines as well. And so yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah the eye catching label, that kind of quirky look is going to get people to 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 grab it and go cool. But then they're trying some good wines and going oh okay cool, and you know maybe yeah. they learn a bit more and eventually they graduate to wanting to get you know uh, buy spend more on wine or you know yeah. that kind of thing. Well, that's it. Some young punks and first drop. Um, there were a few others. I think we all well, appeared. Like the mother's milk. Yeah, the mother's milk. Um, yeah, yeah, and just being able to put a different label on every bottle uh, was something that was pretty unique too back then. Now it's pretty common. Like on all my wines have different labels on them pretty much. But um, yeah, that that wasn't so common back then. But I think it was um, early on. Uh, I, early on, Max Allen did a little piece on me in the Weekend Australian, which sort of opened it up, opened things up, and I ended up getting distributors and stuff. But a few years after that, he followed up with the, a quirky label piece, and he included some young punks and me and First Drop, and said, "These are the ones to look out for because these are the guys that care about the wine going in the bottle. It's not just about the packaging; it's an, you know, it's the whole picture." So um, again, the, there's there's wines out there like that, and then there's the, I guess. 
the bigger wine companies and the supermarkets came on board and thought, yeah, yeah, we can we can do that. So they've they've all you know trotted out their own versions. Some, I mean, beauty in the eye of the beholder, of course, but some are good and some are shit. It is in a way, Yellowtail was the classic one. Yeah, Yellowtail. I wouldn't say quirky, but certainly uh, modern. But just eye catching and not necessarily yeah, yeah. a very traditional looking label. Totally, yeah, and obviously export driven kangaroo. Yeah. But um, no, I reckon yeah. that was. I mean, at the time, it was a it was a great label for a large commercial operation and. Obviously, they were enormously successful, and the label probably it was part of that. I mean, mostly it was just having that access to distribution in the states and then mm, um, filling a hole. But um, price, certainly, pricing. certainly the label, yeah, and price, of course, definitely price. But um, also, the, I think the label certainly wasn't um, a, a negative. If it was a positive, it was a good label. So, how did um, Wine by Brad sort of evolve into Amato? Well, um, stepping stones. I knew right from the start Wine by Brad was, was too polarising. I wasn't going to find myself on the top restaurant list of the, of the world, so I, I knew I'd have to introduce something else. And it was around 2007, eight. Uh, I brought in um, a new label, which is called Mantra, which we still do for our classic Margaret River varietals. Um, and that was a slightly less offensive label to the to some of the conservatives out there. So I found, um, and, and yeah, we you know, threw a bit more new oak at it uh, for the reds and, and the chardonnay, and um, probably styled up the wines a little bit more. Um, uh, and then yeah, took took those out to the trade because you knew I knew that there were some places that some venues that wouldn't even let me in the door with the Brad wines. So with the Mantra wines, suddenly new doors started opening up. So that was sort of stage two of the business. And then um, in, I guess, recent times, three or four years ago, uh, I'd, all, I mean, I'd always had this interest in Mediterranean varieties uh, and drinking Mediterranean wines. Um, but, yeah, at some point I thought, well, I'm just, I'm just going to start seeking some of these out, find out who's got them um, around Margaret River and, and, and start making some wine from them. But probably Was there much? There's not a lot in Margaret River. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a little. But um, what I did find to sort of segue over to um, South Australia, it was a mate of mine, Ashley Ratcliffe from Yolumba, who had his own private interest in vineyards. He had a bunch of these of um, Italian varieties. Form, and, formerly uh, Wacky Grape. On wacky Terra. Grapes, yeah, Wacky, wacky Grapes. grapes yeah. Now Ricaterra Farms. Um, and and for those uh, long-time listeners, um, you you might uh, be familiar with the likes of Uni Cozzello and uh, and Brash Higgins. They they both uh, are customers, I guess, yeah, of, yeah. Uh, of Ricaterra Farms. Uh, and like Steve Bell from Bellwether. Yeah, there's a few of us. So future that... guest, future guest, hopefully. <laughs> Future guests coming soon. Um, so it was probably Ashley that that got me started with the whole Amato Vino thing because I met Ashley at the Future Leader Program, which is an industry that, uh, sorry, a program that the wine industry runs, uh, putting a bunch of interesting people from different facets of the industry together. And, and what they're trying to achieve is that they'll get a whole bunch of new people. Who, who want to take up leadership roles within within the industry on whether it's on committees and at associations or whatever. So the Future Leader Program is where I met Ashley Ratcliffe and another couple of um, good friends now, Toby Beckers and Tom Ward. Um, but Ashley had his own private interest at that time with these Italian varieties on his uh, Ricaterra Farms property in Barmara in the Riverland. Now everyone listening probably thinks Riverland, oh, yeah, Big vineyards, lots of water, lots of shitty wine, big commercial enterprises, but but dotted all throughout the Riverland, there are lots of little growers making really interesting um, alternate, or shall we say, alternate varieties, emerging varieties, uh, which to them are probably not that emerging. They've been around for years, but no one ever wanted them before. But um, there's some really interesting stuff there, and Ashley is one of those guys who's been playing around with with the Italian varieties. So he said to me. I need someone to make some wine from my, you know, varieties instead of just selling them off to some of the big, big um, companies. He wants to make small, you know, high quality wines and really make a name for Riverland as something other than a, a big commercial uh, region, river region. So that's that is the loose plan, um, and yeah, it's been really successful. He he, uh, I I made a Vermentino and a, and a Nero Davola from the first in the first year and we, we've um, 
we done, added Montepulciano Chiano last year to that, and this year we've got three more varieties we're, we're adding to it. So it's really, really building. And these this are all, is all from the Ricotera uh, vineyard. Yeah, Ricotera Farms, um, and they're all like small batch wines. Um, but that's that's what I want at the moment. I want to you know, make little small batches, play around, learn more, learn. You know, we've done three vintages of Nero now, and I'm just feeling like I'm getting a handle on it. And that's in saying that I'm, I'm in Margaret River, and of course the wine has to be made in South Australia for me. But obviously, I you know send send instructions and specs to the wine the wineries, and we're talking regularly and emailing, and you know any any issues pop up, we have the conversation. But and I'll I'll call in into South Australia a couple of times during vintage if I can. Mm. Um, so it's you know friends really uh, looking after the wine for me back there, but. Uh, that's that's where Amato Vino really started, and it was after that first year where I I thought, gee, I'm I'm really loving this. I need to find some around Margaret River, so I went out hunting Margaret River uh, emerging varieties, and um, came up with some Nebbiolo and Tiroligo, some good old Northern Italian varieties uh, in Margaret River uh, to make in 2013, and, and we've added quite a bit more to that now from Margaret River and. Uh, Whilst I'd like to make a lot more, I think my age is probably saying, that's enough, that's enough varieties at the moment. Too many skews. So, you know, you know what it's like. You don't want too many skews, do you? Well, I do, but they don't probably. Yeah. I, don't I don't know. There's a customer for everything, I guess, but it's just a question of <laughs> right. going out and finding them. Um, now, the label kind of thing, the, the, the interesting approach to labelling also continue with Amato. Uh, uh, yep. I think you, you showed me... Uh, one of the actual paintings, which um, is on the the Graciano Carignano. Oh yeah, the Carignano Graciano. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Um, and so, tell me, like, how do you how do you actually kind of think about um, doing the painting that becomes a label for a wine? Ooh, um, the do you paintings... think about the wine and sort of get get inspiration from there, or do you just do a painting and go, yeah, oh, I can look... apply that to that wine? Comes both ways because the first couple that I did, I'd already had the paintings. The paintings had already been done before I made the wine, so I just adopted the paintings. Um, and these are paintings that just sit around my house. You know, you got being a, being a bloody winemaker, you don't have any money to go buy artwork, so you got to paint your own to fill up your house. So, so I borrowed, I pinched a couple of my own pieces of art to go on the Nebbiolo and the Tirol to go. But after that, I, I thought, well. Uh, in particular with the Carignano Graciano being a, a Spanish, I guess, kind of wine in my head. Uh, I painted a, a picture specifically for that and, and much to my partner Lisa's chagrin, it's got a pig on it and it's sitting over the, you know, it's sitting in the main living room, this massive pig on a green background. So, yeah, sometimes it, the art's already there. Sometimes I, I paint something for it. The, the new wine that I'm about to knock out in a couple of – or bottle in a in – um, well, actually bottle tomorrow but not release in a month or so is uh, – I painted specifically for that as well and that's a Trousseau, um, which I think might be the first Trousseau uh, possibly in Australia. I don't know. There must be another one out there. Listeners, if you know of any other trousseaus being made in Australia, yeah, but uh, but certainly you know. there can't be. Even if there is another, it's one of a uh, very you know very small few, group. Yeah. And yeah. so definitely, I think there'll be some people. If you love uh, Jura wines, and you should definitely uh, be interested in this trousseau. Yeah, it's made more in that style. Last year, um, last year I used the grapes to make what I called a bastardo, the crazy bastardo. It's the same grape variety, bastardo and trousseau. And bastardo is is Portuguese, uh, and they they make port with it or rosé, I think. And um, and in the as uh, the, and the French the Jura um, is called trousseau. So it's the same grape variety, but. Last year, because the Bastardo wasn't anything like a Jura wine, and I understand that Jura is quite popular in Australia, Trousseau, I thought I'm not going to call it Trousseau because people will buy it and get the wrong impression. Um, so I called it Bastardo and put some crazy packaging on it. Um, and, yeah, but this year, this one this year is definitely more in the, I guess, the French mould. Uh, so it'll, it'll go with um, a new painting that I've just finished a few weeks back. Uh, a bit of, I've got more wines to come out. Later in the year, so I better start painting stuff. I think. Mm, yes. Well, um, certainly. Uh, sounds like you've got lots of stuff to do. So um, I'll uh, I'll let you get back to uh, to all those fun activities, paintings, and wine thank you, James. And uh, thank you for your time on the the Vincast today. Thanks, mate. I think I rabbited on. It was all about me, wasn't it? I didn't get to ask you anything. No, that's all right. <laughs> How are you, mate? 
I'm I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Thanks for having me. No, it's it's my pleasure. Uh, you know, and obviously, thank you for uh, for welcoming me into your home and um, sharing Feeding some you. wine and your experience and some. Uh, some food, of course, but uh, I look forward to when you are back in Melbourne or maybe when I'm back over in Margaret River and I'd certainly look forward to the, to the new ones coming up, but um, yeah, thanks again. I'll save you a trousseau. Awesome. See you soon. And as always, guys, thank you very much for listening to another episode of The Vincast. I have been James Scarsbrook, otherwise known as The Intrepid Wino. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Intrepid Wino. And you can follow the podcast on Twitter at The Vincast. If you go to facebook.com forward slash Intrepid Wino, you'll find my little Facebook page. Uh, and if you search for Intrepid Wino, one word on YouTube, you'll find my YouTube channel. Uh, and there's a few videos there, but um, that's where I'm going to be... Uh, uh, doing the uh, Let's Taste uh, videos, the live streaming. So make sure you're tuned in on the 27th of July at 6 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, if you go to intrepidwino.com, you'll find every episode of the podcast as well as lots of different writings and links uh, that I've got there. And that's a, a good place for you to uh, qu- uh, write some comments or um, send me a question. Uh, you can also email me at thevincast at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you on uh, on iTunes, on the podcast app. Uh, if you look for the Vincast page, uh, you can give me a, a rating and a review. That would be fantastic because it does help get the word out. But you can subscribe to the podcast on uh, other formats like Stitcher and Player FM. So my question for this week is what do you think, what variety, what alternative variety do you think has the most potential in Australia? in the future let me know use the hashtag wino asks uh, and hopefully i'll read out your responses on the next episode of the vincast make sure you're going to differentdrop.com and putting in the code vincast vino at purchase to get 25 dollars off your first purchase over 100 uh, thank you very guys for your support thanks to brad for uh, being on this episode uh, hope you enjoyed it i will see you next time bye